<laughs> so, so remember last time we've, uh, so, so far we had the covenant with Adam, right? Uh, and then we had the covenant with, um, with Noah, and then we have the covenant with Abraham. And from Abraham forward, you have uh, the division of all the people on the planet between the descendants of Abraham and everyone else, right? Because of the promise to Abraham that says, through your seed, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so that's why uh, when, you know, when you get to the New Testament, there's this, there's this big issue between, uh, between Jews and Gentiles, right? And, and uh, how the Jewish people are a special people. And we're going to discover uh, that identity tonight going through the story of Moses. And so I'm going to assume that you're fairly familiar with this story and just hit the highlights. And so uh, you probably all remember that the, uh, the Jewish people are slaves in Egypt. Uh, they've been there for 400 years. They have multiplied, and so that they are a large group of people now, like literally millions of people. And uh, the Egyptians are afraid that if they ever rose up in some sort of revolt, that, um, that they would be a very powerful foe, right? And you, would, you, know, you don't want your slaves re re revolting against you. And so, uh, so as time goes on, they become more and more cruel towards the Israeli people. And eventually, of course, gets to the point where uh, the Pharaoh commands that uh, all the male babies who are being born should be executed. And Moses' mother uh, has a male child and, uh, and obviously wants to save its life. And so she puts it in a basket and floats it down the river, probably very strategically. And, uh, and it's found and adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, and that's very significant because uh, it means that Moses was raised in the household, the royal household of the Pharaoh, which means he would have received the very best education, right? He would have received the, you know, you know, all the, the writing, the history, the philosophy, all of the stuff that was, uh, that built the Egyptian culture, he would have been educated in it. And from, from a very early time, I think he sensed this calling, right? Uh, because you remember, uh, he's, he's, not a very, uh, he's not very old, he's still a young man when he goes out and uh, uh, he sees an Egyptian abusing one of the uh, Israelites and he uh, goes to the defense of his people and ends up murdering the Egyptian, right? And so there was something, there was something there that said that he was connected to these people and that they shouldn't be mistreated and that, that somehow he might even feel like that was, it was his role to help deliver them, right? But of course, as soon as the, you know, he commits his murder and he buries the body in the sand, uh, you know, the, he realizes this, is, <laughs> this isn't going to work, and so he ends up running away. And he runs out into the wilderness where he tends his, uh, his father-in-law's sheep and, and uh, herds for 40 years. Which is kind of interesting because I think uh, you know, with that type of calling, when you, I think that sometimes God puts things in our hearts, like maybe uh, even when we're children or when we're young, things that uh, a, a desire to do something, right? A, a desire to accomplish something, a gifting or a calling. And lots of times I think that we try to make that work somehow, and it doesn't work, and so we just give up on it, right? Uh, and so, you have, I mean, you can certainly see that in Abraham's life. Uh, Abraham had the promise from God that he was supposed to have children. It wasn't working out as fast as he wanted. Like, okay, I'm going to take this in my own hands. And of course, that didn't work out. Uh, and then you have Moses, where it's sort of like, I, I feel like I'm supposed to help my people. Uh, it doesn't work out. And so he just runs away. And, uh, and of course, while he's out in the wilderness, he sees the burning bush. We're all familiar with that story. The significant part of that is that uh, God reveals his name, right? I am who I am. And it becomes the name of the God of the Israelites. And of course, a part of that story is he also identifies himself, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So it's not just uh, you know, this, this, uh, this being that's a part, that is, that is being itself, but it's also a being that's in relationship with his covenant people. So he... So he there's two things revealed there about God, that he is, he is beyond all of creation, 
And yet at the same time, he intimately connects himself with his people. And so he sends Moses to, uh, to Pharaoh, and, uh, and, and the message that he brings to Pharaoh is, let my people go so that they can serve me. And that word serve is actually the same word that's used for the priesthood uh, later on when they're establishing the tabernacle and uh, establishing the Jewish liturgy that the priests serve in the tabernacle, right? So that, so that this, this, uh, this calling, what, what Moses uh, is communicating here is that he's, he's bringing these people out of slavery so that they can be uh, in, in the right relationship, in a liturgical relationship, in a, in a worship relationship with their God. Right? And that's the whole point of getting them free. Like, like, let my people go so that they can come and be in this liturgical worship with me. To be in this intimate fellowship with me. And you remember uh, when he arrives, the, uh, the Jewish people are pretty hesitant. They're sort of like, I don't, we don't think this is going to work. And, and, then you, uh, and then you have the series of plagues. And sometimes those plagues, are, when you're reading through them, seem, uh, they, they're, they're pretty bizarre, it seems to us. You know, like, okay, the river turns to blood, and uh, there's darkness, and there's locusts. But when, uh, if, if you're familiar with the Egyptian deities, then it makes much more sense. Because each of these plagues is related to a specific Egyptian god. Right? And so, uh, so there's a, a specific Egyptian god that's in charge of the Nile River. You remember the Egyptian thing was like they're, they're really the gods were everywhere and in charge. They're very integrated with nature. So you have a sun god, and you have rain gods, and you have river gods, and you have field gods. And so you have this god of the Nile River. <laughs> And so, what God does is demonstrate, I am more powerful than, the, than this God of the river. I am more powerful than the goddess of fertility. See, that, that crazy thing where there's frogs everywhere, right? Um, uh, and so, with each one of these, God is making a statement about his power over the gods of Egypt. And it's very interesting, you, you know, as you go down, you get to, the, you know, the darkness, right? Uh, Amon-Re, the sun god. And so, and so to demonstrate that he is more powerful than the sun god, God causes there to be darkness, right? And so if you were an Egyptian, and you worshipped the sun god, and there was a temple to the sun god, and there was priests to the sun god, and now it's dark, that would probably be a crisis. Right? <laughs> it would be sort of like, what happened to our God that he didn't get up this morning? Right? <laughs> and then, of course, when it comes to the very last one, they have a, a, a God who is the, the, the God of life. Right? And, and it's really a statement about Pharaoh, because Pharaoh himself claimed to be a deity, and of course his firstborn son also would have claimed deity because he was going to become Pharaoh. And so, so the, the, this, this last plague the, you know, was the ultimate kind of in your face to the Pharaoh saying, no, like, you are not God, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so, and, and if you, uh, you know, you read through that, you have Moses, you know, warning and, and uh, pleading with Pharaoh. And you'd think at this point, right, you'd think that after this has happened nine times, that Pharaoh has come in, or Moses has come into Pharaoh and said, okay, like, this, this isn't going to be good, but this is what's going to happen. You would think that when it gets to this point where Moses says, the firstborn of every family is going to die, Pharaoh would listen, right? But of course he doesn't. And so Moses goes back to the Israelites and it's very interesting because the, uh, the Israelites had lived in a certain section of, the, of Egypt and, uh, and they hadn't been affected by the plagues. They had been preserved from the plagues. But Moses goes to them and says, uh, there's only one escape. There's only one way to, uh, to be preserved from this plague. And he gives them very, very specific instructions for this very first Passover. So they were to take a lamb and it had to be a perfect male lamb without any blemishes 
without any handicaps, uh, and that they were to, uh, to slaughter the lamb without breaking any of its bones, that they were to dip a hyssop branch in the blood and apply the blood to the doorposts and lintel of their homes, right? And, I, and actually, when, you know, the, the first time I had this, I had like, you know, this going really slow and having some pictures. The, I should, probably should have saved the hyssop branch with the blood because, you know, like, you, you, know, when, you, you know, first of all, we don't deal with blood at all, right? For the most part, and so and and blood is kind of gross, and and so it showed uh, this artwork that I was going to show as this, you know, this person sticking the branch in a in a bucket of blood, and when he pulls it out, of course, it, it's not nice and neat, right? And so there's like really blood everywhere, and when you applied it, you know, to the top of the door, it was like down the door and on the sides of the door, and so it's kind of this like gruesome looking thing, but it's very interesting because what you ended up doing was making the sign of the cross, right? Exactly. And so they applied the, the blood to the doorposts, and then they had to roast the lamb and eat the lamb in its entirety so that there wasn't any lamb left over, and they had to be dressed and ready to escape their slavery. And the final thing was, you're going to do this every year as a remembrance. And this idea of remembrance, if you're, a, if you're Eastern Jewish culture, this idea of remembrance isn't just like, oh, remember that this happened a long time ago. It is, the remembrance is that you enter into the reality of it personally, just like you're there and it's happening, right? And so for a Jewish person celebrating the Passover, even if it's, uh, even if it's today and it happened 3,000 years ago, would say, God brought me out of Egypt, <laughs> Right. So, so obviously, when you come to the Last Supper, the Last Supper gets celebrated on the Passover. And in the time of Jesus, when the when the celebration of the Passover happens, uh, of course, Jerusalem is the central place for uh, it's the temple is there, and so all of the lambs have to be sacrificed at the temple. And so if you were a Jew, no matter where you lived, you had to travel to Jerusalem and you had to bring, either bring your lamb or purchase a lamb and the head of the male household would take the lamb and go to the temple and basically they would form this long line of people because you're talking millions of people, right? And they would, uh, they would bring, they would be in line and they would have basically you know, something that would look like an altar rail, <laughs> for those of us who are older Catholics. And they would hold the lamb while the, the priest cut its throat and bled it out, and then they would put it on the spits that they would use to roast it. And the spits would be one down the center of their body, and then one across their arms. And so if you were a Jewish person walking around Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Everywhere you went, you were seeing lambs that looked like they had been crucified. Right? Kind of, kind of, in, kind of significant, I think. And so, and then this, this idea that there's no broken bones. Remember when Jesus dies on the cross, uh, that, uh, you know, it's getting close to sunset and the Jewish people, of course, can't do anything after sunset on the Sabbath. And, uh, and so the Roman soldiers are breaking the legs of the people they've crucified so that they'll die quicker. Uh, it causes them to suffocate. But when they come to Jesus, they decide, he's already dead, we don't need to break his legs. Right? Which is, which is very significant when, uh, when you look at, you know, that was not an uncommon practice in Roman cru crucifixions, but when you uh, look at the Shroud of Turin, then you, uh, you have a person who has been crucified obviously crucified, and uh, none of their bones were broken. And then, of course, uh, you know, the, the blood gets applied to, to the doorposts. And in the first Passover, the idea is that when the angel of death comes to visit the household, it'll see the blood on the doorpost and pass over that house, right? That's where the word Passover comes. And so the early Christians had this uh, had this very clear perspective of Jesus as the lamb that was sacrificed 
for our sake, so that death, when death came to visit, death would pass over us. He's our Paschal Lamb. Uh, you know, in the, at the end of this week, in Holy Week, we're going to be celebrating the Paschal Mystery, right? Which is basically the, the Christian understanding of the Christian Passover. That's really what we're saying with Paschal Lamb, right? The Christian Passover. Now, it's very uh, interesting that this, uh, in the original Passover, if all you did was kill the lamb and put the blood on your doorpost, then you didn't celebrate the Passover, right? That, that in order to fulfill the Passover, the lamb had to be eaten. If you didn't eat the lamb, then you didn't, you didn't celebrate the Passover. And so, when you come to the New Testament... And, and, uh, and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, right? And you come to the Passover and, uh, and the institution of the New Supper, and you have these lambs going around. And, uh, and then Jesus says, This is my body. Take it and eat it. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. Right, and so it's like, okay, like there's lots of connections here. And then, of course, at the Last Supper, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And so this, uh, you know, this, this celebration of the Passover that takes place in Egypt, uh, that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ's crucifixion is, is a really obvious foreshadowing of the crucifixion and the establishment of the new covenant in Christ. And so, as soon as that's done, as soon as they're done eating, they're dressed, they're ready to go, and so they, uh, they run, uh, they, they, they are on their way out of Egypt, and they come to the edge of the Red Sea, and remember at that point, Pharaoh has realized that uh, they're trying to escape, and so he sends his army after them, and so you're thinking, okay, a whole bunch of slaves against a trained army, that's not a good scenario, right? And they're trapped up against the sea with, uh, with uh, Pharaoh's army behind them, and, uh, and the people are full of faith. No, not, not really, they're not full of faith. <laughs> Basically, they turn on Moses and say, why did you do this to us, right? You're just going to get us slaughtered. And, uh, and of course, you know the story, you've probably seen all the movies uh, where uh, Moses holds his rod out over the water and the water's part, and there's these walls of water, and it says that they you know, go through the Red Sea on dry land. And then, and when they reach the other side, Pharaoh's army is chasing them, and the walls collapse, and Pharaoh's army is destroyed. <laughs> right? And so, in a very dramatic and powerful way, the people who were slaves on one side of this water, when they get to the other side of the water, they are no longer slaves. Right? And so the early church fathers saw in that a beautiful illustration of baptism. And so the Catechism says, Above all, the crossing of the Red Sea, literally the liberation of Israel from the slavery of Egypt, announces the liberation brought by, excuse me, wrought by baptism. You freed the children of Abraham from the slavery of Pharaoh, bringing them dry-shod through the waters of the Red Sea to be an image of the people set free in baptism. So some of you might be saying, what are we set free from, <laughs> right? Like, like, they were slaves, but like we haven't been slaves, have we? But of course, Jesus says, anyone who sins is a slave to sin, right? And I don't think it, any of us would, uh, would say we haven't sinned. And of course, when we looked at the fall, we saw that we have that inclination towards sin, and that, uh, if, you know, apart from God's grace, we would probably make the wrong choice most of the time. And of course, looking at the, the history of humanity before the flood uh, demonstrates that humanity can get pretty ugly. But of course, we don't even have to look back that far, do we? <clears throat> so now they're in the wilderness. They're finally they're set free, but there's this desert they have to cross before they can enter into the promised land. And, uh, and God demonstrates his power towards them on the way. So obviously they need water. They come to this pool. Uh, and, but, but they discover that the water is not drinkable. And, and, and it's funny, with each one of these stories, 
the people's attitude is, is always uh, grumbling and complaining. And so, uh, so even though they've just crossed through the Red Sea, even though they're not slaves anymore, uh, as soon as they realize we're out of water and we just came to this water and we can't drink it, they turn on Moses and say, you know, why did you bring us out here? <laughs> like, we, we were better off as slaves, right? And so Moses uh, throws a stick into this water, and, it, and miraculously, now it's drinkable. And so... So there's a, this miracle of, of uh, purifying the waters. And then, of course, they run out of food. And so, again, they come to Moses and say, we, you know, did you bring us out here to starve us to death? <laughs> and, and this is the miracle of the manna, the miracle of the bread from heaven. And, and manna literally means, what is it? Right. So if you, if you were a, a Jewish person and you woke up and you crawled out of your tent and there's this white stuff all over the ground, then you would say, like, manna, <laughs> what is this, right? Uh, and, and every morning, for all of the years that they're in this wilderness, God feeds them this bread. Day after day, month after month, year after year, when they get up in the morning, there is bread on the ground for them to eat. Except on Sabbath, because the day before the Sabbath, you're supposed to collect twice as much you need so that you wouldn't work on the Sabbath, right? And so, uh, so that's kind of interesting, right? It's pretty obvious that this isn't a natural phenomenon. It's not something that fell out of trees because there weren't any trees. There wasn't any, you know, it's just like, this is an, an amazing daily provision that, that happens six times a week, but not on the seventh. And so it's very obvious, I would think, that God is miraculously feeding his people. The interesting thing about that, of course, is that this generation that comes out of Egypt, if we were to finish the whole story tonight, if we were going to read through uh, not only just Exodus, <coughs> where we're, we're talking tonight, but if we were talking to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, then a lot of these stories get repeated. When you're reading through Deuteronomy, they, you know, they, they run out of water again. <laughs> And it's interesting because their attitude is exactly the same. It's almost like they never learn to trust in the Lord. They never uh, develop a faith that says, God is going to take care of me. Which is pretty significant, right? Because when they get to the edge of the promised land at the end of Deuteronomy, uh, you know, God says, okay, here's your land, right? And it's rich and it's full and it's got vineyards and orchards. And, uh, and, uh, and it's occupied, but God says, like, I'm going to drive out the people before you. And the people, for the most part, except for a couple of them, literally a couple of them, say, there's no, like, we're just slaves. There's no way we could take this land. We'll stay in the wilderness. And so that they never enter in to the promised land. And so when Jesus is talking about them in the New Testament... He says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, right? They had miraculous bread from heaven in the wilderness, and yet they died in the wilderness. They never entered into the promised land. And then he goes on to say, but I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my flesh will never die. And so Jesus uh, himself points to this, this manna, this miraculous story of miraculous bread, and says, like, like, I am the fulfillment of that, right? I am the new manna. I am the bread from heaven. But, I, but it's totally different because that old bread didn't transform any human beings, right? It fed their bodies, but it didn't change their hearts. The bread from heaven, the bread of life, changes our hearts. And that makes all the difference in the world. What about the quail? <clears throat> yes, there's quail too. Yeah, God provides quail, meat for them to eat. That's another miracle. <coughs> yeah, miraculous food. You're right, I should have put quail on there. <laughs> we're, stip we're skipping a lot of stuff. <laughs> so then they run out of water, and there's uh, uh, this story where uh, God says to Moses, uh, go and stand on the rock in front of the people and, uh, and strike it with your staff. And when he strikes it, it turns into a fountain, right? 
And so again, you have this, uh, this miraculous event. This gets referred to, again, there's another story like this that happens in Deuteronomy. Uh, Paul refers to it, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a little complicated. We don't have time to go into it, but the idea is that Christ himself is the rock. That's what Paul says when he's writing to the Corinthians. Um, that's, it would be fun to explore that, but we don't have time. But the idea here is that God is miraculously providing for these people in demonstrative, obvious, uh, you know, not this, like you, you don't have to, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith <laughs> to know this is very special bread and this is very special water, right? And yet, there's still this unbelief on the part of the Israelites. And so finally they make it to Mount Sinai. Oh, there's a battle that they win too. We're just going to skip that battle. <laughs> <laughs> We're, see, we're behind already. And so, uh, so we, get to, uh, we get to Mount Sinai, and I think this is, a re- this is a really precious verse. Because what God says is, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Okay, so you've got to put, like, okay, incredible miracles and power, uh, demonstrating his authority and power over all the gods of Egypt. All the gods that they would have been very familiar with living in the Egyptian culture, Right? And so he says, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. See, there's that that intimacy, right? Like that's what God wanted, was to bring them out of their slavery and bring them to himself. He says, now therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God is inviting them to be his people, right? And there's this theme throughout the scriptures about God's desire for a people. And so over and over and over again in the, in the Psalms and in the prophets and even in the New Testament, there's this line that says, I will be your God and you will be my people. That God desires to have a people of intimate relationship. And it's one of the times that you find it in the New Testament is very interesting because it's after Jesus rises from the dead and he encounters Mary in the garden and Mary is, uh, wants to hang on to him and he says, don't hang on to me because I, I need to ascend to the Father, to my Father and your Father. Right? It's that like, that like something is accomplished in this resurrection where God is finally going to have the people that he desires. The other thing to notice in this is the idea that if you will obey my voice, and of course that's a big if, right? Huge if there. Should be like, you know, neon colors flashing. (laughs) If you obey my voice. Now, it's interesting that, uh, that, that in this proclamation, this is before the covenant is established, that the idea of obeying a voice has to do with proximity, right? I mean, like if you're far from me, you're not going to be able to hear my voice. Right? The idea of he, obeying my voice means I'm, go, I'm close enough to hear you. But it also, because he's God, uh, hearing his voice, hearing his word, has, has an effect all by itself. Right? Remember, he created all things by the power of his word. He said, let there be light, boom, and there was light. Right? Uh, so, so this idea of hearing his word, there's a scripture in one of the prophets that talks about his word does not go forth without accomplishing that for which it was sent, right? And so this idea is, if I'm close enough to hear him, to hear his voice, to receive his word, then his word is going to transform me. <laughs> it's very interesting because when we, if, when we get to the covenant story... God begins to speak to them from the mountain, and there's thunderings, and there's lightnings, and there's this dramatic display of power on the mountain, and the people say, we don't want God to speak to us. Like, speak to Moses, and he can tell us what what you said. 
Do you see the disconnect there? <laughs> right? Because even if, if Moses relates God's word to them, it is once removed, right? So it's very interesting. So this, this idea, this invitation to be his people, the invitation to hear his voice, the invitation to keep the covenant. <laughs> and so when they arrive at uh, Mount Sinai, uh, they're, they're about to establish the covenant, and uh, they begin at the bottom with a serial, ceremonial washing, so they cleanse themselves, kind of a repentance thing, right? Cleansing the, uh, the dirt of the wilderness and the Egyptian influences in their lives. Uh, and then there's a sacrifice at the bottom of the mountain, and, uh, and it's on a bronze altar. Uh, they, and and Mo Moses takes the blood and he splashes some on the altar, and then he splashes it and sprinkles it, it says, all over the people. You can think about that on Easter morning when you get sprinkled with holy water. <laughs> you can be thankful that it's holy water and not the blood of the covenant, right? <laughs> And so he, they, uh, so the, and of course that that's the covenantal sacrifice that we've talked about, right? and the purpose of the blood is the idea of, you know, if if we break this covenant, then we deserve to die. So then there's this cloud of fire on the mountain, and uh, and and God calls the people to come up to the mountain. The leaders of the people ascend the mountain into the cloud. And it says, they sat in the presence of God and ate a banquet. So there's a covenant meal. And they describe the throne of God. So, so you're talking, right, these, the, the leaders of, of Israel, these, this uh, large group of people, I don't think it gives a number, but you get the impression, it's a large group of people, ascend the mountain, they, they experience God's presence. They see the throne of God. And the covenant is established. It's pretty amazing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> in this first covenant, it says that they'll become a kingdom of priests. So that, the, so that all the people, every person... Would, would have a priesthood, they would have their uh, ability to be able to offer sacrifices to the Lord, and the idea, of course, of the kingdom of priests is that they would be the kingdom of priests for the rest of the nations, right? They would be the priests <coughs> for all the rest of the world. They would be the conduit through which the rest of the world could come to believe and worship in the one true God. That, uh, that the covenant would be directly between the people and the Lord, uh, that there is just a few stipulations, and those are found in Exodus chapter 20 through 23. So you have three chapters where God you know, gives them some, some, uh, some rules about how to live. And then, and then, of course, Moses goes up on the mountain and receives the Ten Commandments that are written by God. So, pretty awesome covenant, pretty awesome promises. And then, of course, uh, Moses stays up on the mountain. And while he's on the mountain, he is receiving the instructions for how to build the tabernacle. And, uh, and, and it's quite a long section, so you have this whole section where he says, okay, very specific, right? The curtains are going to be red, and they're going to be this length, they're going to be this height, and they're going to be hanging from wooden bars, and it's this type of wood, and they're this long, and the stanchions are this, and they're going to be carved with this, and everything is explicitly laid out, what kind of metal, what kind of wood, how big, how, uh, what color. And it's interesting, the idea that, that God is telling the people how to worship him, right? Because one of the things that, uh, that, that is kind of... Um, uh, a, a modern way of, of approaching a relationship with God is I can worship God whatever way I want to, right? Or, or you know, like I'm going to discover my own spirituality and my own expression of God, and I find God in the woods, and so that's where I'm going to go out in the woods. And of course, uh, spirituality and relationship with God, uh, we want to encounter Him in any way that we can, in all the ways that we can, but when it comes to offering God the worship, right, when we come, then, then, God is very specific about how to do this. You know, what, 
animals to sacrifice and when and why and uh, you know different seasons of the year that there would be seven seven feasts that would last a week each and you know all of these things that are very prescribed so that if the Israelites weren't given the opportunity to say you know like to have like a little vote of like do you think we should offer cows or should we should offer sheep <laughs> right or do you think we should have six holidays or seven holidays it was like very prescribed which is interesting and so you have that, you know, and it says in Hebrews that what Moses was doing was, is that he saw the heavenly worship. He saw what was going on and that the design of the tabernacle is based on what he saw in eternity, the worship that is going on in eternity. Because, you know, angels are worshiping God constantly, right? So, there's, so there's, it's not just this random thing, it is this heavenly worship that God is inviting people to join into. That's why, you know, I, you know, we could never make that up, right? And so he reveals it to us so that we can enter into what is going on in eternity. I'm doing horrible with time, but we'll figure that out later. <laughs> so you notice that when the establishing of the covenant, they go up the mountain, they, you know, they have this, this little process they go through, and when you look at the uh, the, the design of the tabernacle, the idea of the tabernacle is that, that we're, we're always at Mount Sinai. When we go to the temple, we're, we're revisiting the place of the covenant. We are renewing and reestablishing the covenant every time we come to the tabernacle. And so you have uh, out on the outside of the, uh, of the uh, in the outer court it's called, you had a bronze baser, basin for uh, washing. You had the bronze altar to be able to make sacrifices. And then inside a separate tent, you had a golden lampstand and the golden table of bread. And then inside the Holy of Holies, you had the Ark of the Covenant. Something that I noticed that I don't have here is the incense, which of course is the, it should be the cloud going with the incense and the fire going with the lampstand. Big, big omission there, right? <laughs> And so the, uh, the furniture of the tabernacle reflects their experience on the mountain. And you notice the stuff outside the Holy of Holies is bronze. The stuff inside the holy place is all gold. And so that's what it would look like. And so you have a, the, uh, the place, the gate you'd come in. There's the altar. There's a place to wash. And then you, you enter the holy place. The holy place that the priests would enter to be able, excuse me, to be able to change out the bread and to keep the incense going and to keep the oil in the lamps. So they would do that on a daily basis. But then the most holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant sat. And the, and the instructions for the Ark of the Covenant were basically it's a golden chest with two angels on it. And inside the chest are Aaron's rod, the, the tablets that contain the Ten Commandments, and a sample of the manna in, a, in some sort of jar. Okay? So those are the things, the miraculous bread, the, the rod of authority, basically, and the, the divine law. The only time that you could enter into the, the holy place, the, the most holy place, the holy of holies, was once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was the day that you would take, uh, you'd take a goat, and the idea was that uh, the priest would lay its hands on, on it and would confess the sins of the people. Right, so he's putting the sins of the people onto this animal, and then they would slaughter the animal. And then they would take the blood from that sacrifice and into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle it on the ark. Okay, so I, I, I hope that you're, uh, you're thinking in New Testament terms, right? Because you remember, this, uh, this, this is the tabernacle, but, but then later on, when Israel, Israel gets established as a nation, uh, Solomon builds a temple, a, a, you know, a, a massive, beautiful, amazing temple, and it's, it's built with this design, with the same type of worship, the same, you know, actually the same exact furnishings, right? the furnishings that were made in the wilderness. 
And you remember, on the day that Christ was crucified, it says that when Christ died, the veil of the temple was ripped. Right? This, this idea that, that uh, it would have been really clear as a Jewish person who's approaching this, first of all, if you were just a regular Jewish person, you would never even get near this, right? You see the little walls all the way around the outside, that's like, that was like, everybody stays out of here except for the priests. And then, if you were a priest, you could offer the sacrifice and you could wash. If you were lucky, you'd get drawn in a lottery and you might be able to enter the holy place to, to do the oil and the bread and the incense. But once a year, the high priest, and only the high priest, and only once a year, could actually enter into the presence of the Lord. And the moment that the sacrifice is finished, the moment, you know, within moments after Jesus lifts up his voice and says, it is finished, the veil to the Holy of Holies is ripped, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, from the top to the bottom. Right, which is Matthew's way of dramatically declaring we have access to the Holy of Holies now. That because this blood isn't the, the, the writer of Hebrews says, this blood isn't the blood of, of goats and sheep and bulls that never really cleansed anyone of any sin. This is the blood of Christ himself. And Peter says, you know, it's, it's the, you know, we've been purchased with a price, the price of the precious blood of Christ. So, so Moses is at top of the mountain, right? And so we've had this dramatic uh, establishing the covenant. Moses goes up and he's receiving all of these instructions. It's so cool. And then God interrupts this conversation with Moses and says, uh, you know, you need to get out of the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> because those people are being idiots. He doesn't, he doesn't say that uh, exactly, but it's pretty darn close. And, um, and, and, and God, and what happens is that, that, that Moses has been gone for a long time, and so the people decide, like, this is, like, we don't know what happened, but we need a God. <laughs> and we need one right now. And so they gather their gold and they melt it, and they form a golden calf, which is one of, one, of, one of the Egyptian gods, and they declare, this is our god. Now you have to remember, these are the same people who walked like through the Red Sea on dry ground. It's the same people who ate manna every morning, morning after morning. It's the same people who saw water coming out of a rock that hadn't been any water before, they are the same people who, uh, a bunch of them ascended up a mountain and literally saw the throne of God. Now, uh, I would love to think that if I went up the mountain and I saw the throne of God, I, I could wait more than 40 days, right? I, but at the same time, you know, how many of us have uh, had, you know, amazing experiences, you know, we've gone on a retreat, and it's been like, oh my gosh, like God is real, and he loves me, and, and this is so powerful, my life is going to be totally different now, and it's probably not even 40 days, right, <laughs> when we just kind of fall back into the like, oh, that was nice, but that was like, that was a long time ago, and it didn't have anything to do with real life, because real life is hard. <laughs> so I don't think we can blame them. <clears throat> to this incident, other than that the fact that God has revealed himself so clearly. There's a, there's a whole interesting conversation that God and Moses have on top of the mountain where Moses intercedes for the people, which is really beautiful because uh, at one point he says, uh, you know, God says, maybe I should just destroy them and we'll start over with you. Like, I'll make a great nation out of you, Moses, right? And Moses says, no, 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 no. I would rather, you know, I don't remember the exact wording, but basically, I would rather be cut off. You know, like, like, cut me off if you can save these people. Like, he offers himself as a sacrifice, right? It's really a beautiful thing. 
considering, especially considering what a hard time these people have given him, right? And so you know the story, he goes down, he smashes the tablets, and when he smashes those tablets, what he's saying is, you've broken the covenant, right? I mean, the, the first thing, the first commandment is, don't worship any other gods. You've destroyed the covenant. And so from then on, there's a new covenant established. I, I don't think a lot of people realize this, right? That, that the, after the golden calf, the covenant that gets offered to Israel is radically different than the first one that's offered on Mount Sinai. And so in the second covenant, instead of being a nation of priests, there is only one tribe, one out of twelve, the Levites, who will be the priests. That instead of being a direct covenant between the people and the Lord, it's a covenant that is mediated by Moses. And then you have this, uh, you know, hundreds of laws. There are the purity laws, is what they're called, where it's like, okay, you're going to eat differently, you're going to dress differently, you're going to, you know, behave differently, you're going to, you know, like, you're not allowed to marry outside the Jewish nation, you're not, I mean, like, all of these things. And the whole point of the law, and Paul tells us this when we get to the New Testament, the whole point of the law was to keep them from, from, uh, from falling back into idol worship. That it was just, it was like, it was sort of like, it's almost impossible for you not to worship other gods, and so here are a zillion laws <laughs> to help you not do that. The weird thing is that in spite of all of these laws, for hundreds of years, Israel keeps falling into the sin of worshiping other gods. For hundreds and hundreds of years. To the point where you know, part of the nation gets destroyed at one point, and then uh, the, the rest of the nation gets carried off into captivity, and Solomon's temple gets destroyed. And it's only after they've gone into captivity and Solomon's temple is destroyed that the Jewish people finally come to a point where they don't worship other gods anymore. But that's about 800 years from now, <laughs> from this time. And then, of course, the tablets, instead of being written by the Lord himself, are written by Moses. <clears throat> and so, so the rest of the Old Testament is the story of these people uh, in this covenant with God, a very different covenant than the first one that's offered, but a covenant nonetheless. Uh, and this covenant is to, to help them to be a holy people so that they can be prepared for the one who had come to lead them like Moses led them. So there's a scripture in Deuteronomy, I should have uh, put that slide in here, that uh, where Moses promises that God will send a leader to lead them the way that he has led them. And of course, how did, uh, how did Jesus lead like Moses? He led us out of our slavery to sin through the waters of baptism. Uh, there's a, there's a, some very interesting analogies of, uh, you know, m you know Moses, uh, Jesus going up on the, the, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, right? And you remember what the Sermon on the Mount is? It's kind of like a review of the Ten Commandments, uh, but it's kind of uh, highlighting what they really are. And so he says, you know, you've heard it said, do not murder. And so you have this, like Moses on a mountain giving the law, and you have Jesus on the mountain giving the law. But, of course, the law that Jesus gives says, if you're angry with your brother in your heart, then you've already committed murder. So, so the law gets through Christ isn't an outward, you know, like, okay, as long as I don't murder someone, I'm fine. That's, I could keep that law, well, I hope anyway, right? But, oh, now it has to do with my heart, right? It has to do with, oh, gosh, if I have anger, if I have lust, if I have envy... It's totally different. So, so the, the old covenant is very focused on outward behavior. But remember the prophet Jeremiah says that when the new covenant comes, it's going to be about a changed heart. And so our, our, uh, our list of covenants, we start with Adam, 
uh, and it's a couple. We go to Noah, and it's a family. We go to Abraham, it's a tribe. And finally, when we come to Moses, it is a nation of people. And you notice that this is you know, slowly uh, the covenant people, God's people, is growing. 